PrepareForChange.net is owned and managed by a worldwide community of volunteer lightworms who come together to guide humanity through its planetary transition, the event. PrepareForChange.net sets the example by working for the greater good and was created at the request of the resistance movement. If you are moved to help us help the world, why not join us today? Prepare for Change brings truth so that we may change our ways into the path of grace instead of the path of slavery and destruction. Once we know, we can prepare ourselves for change and remember how to allow God's co-creative mind to assist us in making the best choices for all. Else, we will simply suffer the consequences of our inaction or unbalanced action, which is the result of ignorance. Confronting hard truths and being in service to others is the path we all benefit from. Our planet gives to us every single moment. Now it's time to give back to her. Come visit Prepare for Change to discover much, much more than you've been taught by the corrupt establishment, hell-bent on preying on your ignorance. Together, we can be the change we want to see in the world. Today, Prepare for Change is again at Portal to Ascension Conference in Irvine, California. Many incredible speakers are here presenting, as well as this fellow here to my right, your left, Billy Carson. Thank you. Uh, we are consolidating our efforts this year, Prepare for Change and Portal to Ascension, so we are working in tandem, which is kind of a new slash. We're going to be presenting a little bit more content and this type of video content, so we're happy to have that in our bailiwick and coming at you. Today, we're pleased to speak with Billy Carson. Billy Carson is the author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. Billy is also an expert host on the new original streaming series by Gaia named Deep Space. Yep. Correct? Mm -hmm. The series is an exploration of secret space program and the types of technologies being used along with their potential origins. Mr. Carson is also an expert host on Gaia's original series, Ancient Civilization. A team of renowned scholars has come together to decipher the riddle of our origin and piece together our forgotten history. We can get into all of that stuff. I don't want to go too long into it because we want to talk to you. Yeah. You're a futurist. Mm -hmm. um, your life path seems to have put you into a bunch of just phenomenal s scenarios and situations. Yeah. But all of that started really early with you. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's pretty cool to think. You know, I know you're sort of early 60s, right? I don't mm -hmm. want to give away your age, but that's a little bit older than myself. Mm -hmm. When I started getting into technology and stuff, mm -hmm. it put me on a path that, in retrospect, yeah. I realized that, oh, this was all sort of a plan. Right. <laughs> it happened this way. So, mm -hmm. kind of go into like how you first started like uh, being a futurist, thinking yeah. of the future and, and your technology and stuff, right? You know, um, Growing up uh, for my younger years in Queens, New York, uh, everything was just pretty standard. You know, I didn't really, I mean, I was just a toddler, but still, I was pretty aware. I was uh, already reading books by the age of one. Not kitty books, but real books. Oh, no kitty. Yeah, and um, so I had that aptitude from back then. We then moved from uh, New York, Queens, New York, yep. in a nice quaint Cambria Heights uh, suburb to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was change. And uh, that was a big like flip flop. Um, we went right to the ghetto, really. Um, and uh, the exact reasons why we moved out of there, I still I'm still scratching my head as to the full reason why. But we had, that's where we ended up. But we lived close to the Opelika Airport. And this area had a small private airport and planes would fly over. So I'd go out in the backyard and just watch airplanes go over. Uh, and this is like 1977. Exactly. And I'm looking at these airplanes, and this one object came over that wasn't an airplane. Now, the word aliens and flying saucers and UFOs wasn't even in my vocabulary yet. Sure. We only had four channels on TV, no cable TV exists, no all-day cartoons, you know. I just knew that what I saw it didn't have a cockpit, it didn't have wings, you know, it didn't have right. a fuselage. And right away, I said, I got to find out what this is. And it, it cleared the horizon point in seconds, not minutes, which was right. astounding. And it came back the way that it came in. It hovered for about... 10 seconds maybe quietly and then it flew out you know and i was just like this is incredible it was more like an oval not like a per perfectly round more like an oval yeah. shape um so i went to to rainbow park elementary the next day and i got all the aerospace books on from the encyclopedia britannica uh and i just started researching literally from 1977 i've been researching aerospace and looking at technology and 
that's how I got into knowing about advanced technology and what the military you know, was releasing back then and things like that. And then from there, it just was able to allow me to project my mind to the future to see, where, wow, if we're at this now, where can we go? Right. Right. 5, right. 10, 15, 20, 100 years. So that's what really kickstarted me. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. I heard that you, what, what I think is really unique to you in your story is that your brand, obviously, yeah. um, you've been in this world of uh, commerce mm -hmm. and you've been successful in that. Yeah in this awakening discovery spiritual mm -hmm. cosmic kind of world yeah you have a lot of people that are telling their stories and have had experiences but few yes. of them that are really a legitimate brand like yeah. you are right and because of that sort of futurist sense that you had mm -hmm. you uh i heard open up store and, and, and had yeah. sort of an internet business company too in new york city is that right yeah well it was um this is all the way back now into the um the 80s the early 80s my dad, you know, he told me, like, you know, you, if you want clothes, and this is when I was 12. <laughs> He's like, if you want clothes and stuff and school supplies, you're going to have to buy them. You're going to have to find a way to generate money. And I was like, wow. So I went and got a job at the Miami News, which was a subscription service for delivery. I was selling the subscriptions. I, was, I became the top subscription seller. I took that money and I invested it into this company. I found something called an Opportunity Magazine, which they have in a lot of the grocery stores still to this day. Uh -huh. yeah, awesome. There's a company still in there called Galaxy Electronics, based out of New York City. Okay. I saw that they um, they had these digital car radios with cassette decks in them, high power car radios, digital, and everything. What you know, even in the car that my dad had was just right. eight track. Right. Some were dialed. You know, so I saw the future. Like, oh, this is where everything is going to go. Even as you know, a kid. Right. And I invested my money into those radios at a wholesale rate. And then I began to sell them retail to us, to upperclassmen and people from different neighborhoods. Uh -huh. And it came, became a full-fledged electronics company. You know, yeah, by the time I was crazy. 13, I was earning more money than my parents. <laughs> well, how did that feel? Well, you know, it felt good. I was able to help them a little bit more, Great. you know, chip in with some bills. We were pretty poor. I was able to buy myself some shoes that didn't have holes in them and <laughs> buy myself pants that didn't have rips in the crotch because I outgrew them. You know, so just uh, I was able to take care of myself a lot better. And I saw the benefit of marketing and sales and and think future thinking. That's right. And finding the next thing that you can generate revenue. And I was I, I knew from an early age, the key to making money is to find a need and fill it. And so that's what I began, you know, to do. That's right. So in, in your exploration, how did that lead you to seeing the, the experience having the UFO in the backyard yeah. and just researching books and books and as far mm -hmm. as that goes, in, in addition to setting that sort of business, because mm -hmm. there's an, another facet of your life was you sold that business at a point early yeah. on mm -hmm. and took up, uh, what, as an athletic trainer or something? Yeah, well, that company itself, um, it just, uh, as other, uh, I guess, more warehouse type stores started popping up around different neighborhoods right. and started competing with more because they can do the installations and so forth. So as by the time I got to be like 14 and a half, almost 15, it died down a little bit. Uh, and then I would say I just got into like regular marketing businesses. But later on, uh, around 1998, I saw a commercial that came on TV and it was an IBM commercial that said IBM.com. And I'm going dot com. What is this dot com thing? So I started looking into it. It's a website. Yep. And it was only at that time, I think, 20 websites in existence. This is how young this is. That's right. And I was like, wow, this is going to be the future. I knew right away. And the synchronicity of the universe, my next door neighbor, where I had just moved to this new community, he was an exchange student from Arabia. Uh -huh. And he, he saw me outside and we had said hi a few times or whatever. He says, do you have a business? I said, yeah, I actually do. I have a healthcare, discount healthcare plan that I sell. Uh -huh. And he says, well, I have to build a website for a company. Oh, that's how, that's that's right how it right. happened. Yeah, so he, he built the website and I watched what he did. And when he left and went back, I went to rent a center. I got myself a, a rented computer for nineteen ninety five a week. You know, they had those back then. Huh? Oh, yeah, a Packard Bell. I call it a Packard from hell because it crashed. <laughs> Two gigabyte hard drive. And uh, I would go to the bookstore and study all the programming codes there and then just memorize them and go home and duplicate it. And I started making websites and for mortgage companies and so forth and built that into a multi-million dollar dot com company and sold it to Globebench Systems. There which then go. sold it to the Amber Alert Company. Yeah, see, I, oh, I didn't, I didn't ever hear that part of the yeah. story, but that's pretty amazing. I'm curious about that because myself got into database marketing and knew about LexisNexis. Okay. Probably around '92 or '91, '92, '93. Wow. And it was super, super early as well. Yeah. And I got into advertising and marketing, and the first place that I ended up working at was Ogilvy, mm -hmm. an agency mm -hmm. in the data, data. Uh, direct marketing 
okay. part of the agency. But that's where they were calling all of that data. Yeah. And uh, in retrospect, as you look at it, you can understand sort of like, I don't, I don't know if we'll get into it, but we understand that there's like different tracks of sort of the control mm -hmm. type of mechanisms, the yeah. families and how they want to steer, mm -hmm. control the media, control financial, control yeah. data. And mm -hmm. data nowadays is such a big thing. Yeah. But I was really close at the inception of sort of Microsoft, later Amazon and yeah. Apple and things like that. The point is your path kind of divinely guides you somehow. Yeah. So you have that side. There must be big things in store for you. We'll mm -hmm. get into that a little bit later. But with those experiences, you went out and did a little bit of uh, sort of what your spiritual journey type of work, or was it um, more about history? What what? It really, uh, you know, kind of being raised on a Christian ideology, but not fully Christian because nobody went to church in my family, and they still had uh, things like idols and statues and things like that. So I never could figure out like why are we even saying amen at the end of prayers, things like that. Uh, so it was kind of a weird kind of upbringing, kind of like we were just playing a role. Uh, but once I started learning and tapping into information about ancient history and realizing that a lot of the information, a lot of the more uh, what I call modern religious texts and books was copied from these ancient tablets, cylinder scrolls and ancient scriptures that were discovered in many various different caves. And, uh, and then coming to the understanding that a lot of stuff was written far after a lot of the people were long gone and dead. That's when I began to realize that, oh, wow, you know, the true way to live for me is to have direct connection with source, to have, to understand. And I understood early on because of science that science and spirituality went together. I didn't see it as separate. A lot of people saw it as separate. That's an interesting point. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's an interesting, we were speaking to Ray yeah. uh, Hernandez earlier. Mm -hmm. And just my direction to uh, some disclosure, I mean, it was never much of a ufologist. Yeah. I, I knew that that stuff was there and had some experiences, mm -hmm. but always, again, a divine plan was yeah. more about the spiritual side. And at the base of what um, Prepare for Change is, mm -hmm. really is rediscovering sort of that oneness yeah. and the spiritual right. type of stuff. And all of that stuff is historic. Mm -hmm. When you look around, from my perspective, I became an art director. Okay. In graphics, you know, I was lucky enough that my parents took us to some sacred locations. Oh, nice. And when you're seeing pyramid complexes, mm -hmm. <laughs> that stuff is just like, what the heck is going yeah. on here? There is such a greater intelligence that must have been at play at that time. Yep. Whatever it was. So I'm sure that's kind of a similar path that you had. Too. Oh, yeah. Well, my mother told me when I was a young kid, like 1978, that there were advanced beings that had airports on top of mountains. And she said one of them was at Machu Picchu in the Nazca lines. Yeah. Uh, and she said that uh, that stuff was built by other people that didn't come from here. And that she said that uh, just like it says in the Bible, there was nothing new under the sun. I think that's Ecclesiastes 11:11 uh, 11, 11 or something like that. But so that stuck with me for a very long time. And when I got older and started realizing that quantum mechanics, quantum physics and spirituality kind of went hand in hand. In other words, one kind of really described the other. Uh, I saw that and then learning the ancient text. I saw that what those books were doing were utilizing that information for more for control and to keep you separated from your true divine nature. Sure, right. And so I just took the whole step, you know, straight path to divi divinity, understanding the, the oneness, the consciousness really rules everything. Uh, and that being of service to others and helping people and showing unconditional love will get you to a f much further than begging and pleading some sky wizard, you know, with a magic wand. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people, our generation, that sort of walk away or turn their back on religion understand yeah. that oh it's a big method of kind of control yeah and it doesn't take what, what we do try to do prepare people for change mm -hmm. is to seed all of these different claims and stories that yeah. you know a religion tells you this mm -hmm. but they're doing this on one side but they're doing this on the other side right it just is to spark people's curiosity so they start yeah. researching these things themselves right. and you're going to pretty quickly find that oh you know, there was uh, the Council of Nicaea that right. sort of got together and decided <laughs> we're going to write, write history this way. History yeah, was written by the Victor exactly. Sure. So you kind of, that kind of goes into uh, the work that you've done with that Emerald Tablets yeah. and the Compendium. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, a, is that a more recent book? Yeah, that's a, oh, I did volume one a year and a half ago. Oh, right. And it's the same book, but when I 
uh, a professional uh, publisher saw the book, read, bought it and read it, and then stepped to me and said, hey, I want to talk to you about this book. I think we can make it better. I think we can make it easier to understand for the average person. That's why this one says a beginner's guide on it. I was getting a lot of people contacting me and going, this is just too much science. This is just too much. Like, I'm not a quantum physicist. I don't understand what you're talking about here. So it was 444 pages, the first book. And uh, she helped me get it down to 238 pages, or I believe it is now, with the same information, same content, but a lot easier to understand some of the science parts. Not the esoteric, the esoteric wisdom I wrote stayed the same, but just breaking down some of the big articles that I had, science articles, uh, and then put a nicer cover on it, because the cover I made myself, she made this cover with a real artist, uh, and uh, re reduced the font size, shrunk, took away some of the empty space, just made it to where I can actually make it seem more manageable. People were like looking at the book like, oh my God, I can't read this, it's too thick. Study it, please, yeah. Now, some of the people who I gave the second volume to, which is thinner, not that much, half the size, and a lot easier to understand. They're going, oh my God, I can't, this is amazing. I'm glad you did this. You know, so it really worked out well. Now the book became a bestseller on Amazon. So her theory was right. You're doing something right. That's yeah. for sure, you know. <laughs> uh, work with the people that make you better. I love yeah. surrounding myself with people that are much more talented than I am. They make us look, look pretty good. Absolutely. So dive into it. There's, are there kind of two paths within the books or mm -hmm. the scientific? Yeah. How would you describe the other one? The more yeah. sort of esoteric side of it? You know, so I started reading the animal tablets uh, and the, the, by Tho, you know, the original uh, text that had been deciphered. Is he also pronounced Tehote? Tehuti, Tehuti, Quetzalcoatl, I mean, the names are just endless. No kidding. It's yeah, called, Odin. Called. Have you uh, ever heard of Amaruka? Amaruka, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, right yeah, yeah. Yep. Kukulkan, yep. Uh, yeah, Veracocha, I mean, we, <laughs> we okay, can tell, okay. yeah. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> yeah. Then that's why I was yeah. thrilled to have the conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Matter of fact, I just started a new Instagram account called Tehuti Fitness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, see, many, many names. Uh, but I was reading these tablets, and um, I saw a lot of esoteric information in there, but I also started seeing a lot of science and technology. So I started researching people who had gone and had their hands on the tablets. A lot of famous people, everybody from Isaac Newton and right. the Queen of Sheba, St. Thomas Aquinas, Roger Bacon, Michael Dory. I mean, I can just keep going on and on. Madame yeah, Madame Vesky, all these big scholars. and But they had uh, inspiration from the tablets only for more alchemical, metaphysical uh, type of a concept. And I was like, wow, that's great and everything, but what about this technology nobody's talking about? What about the quantum mechanics and quantum physics nobody's talking about? So I saw it, I said, after about reading it about 80 to 90 times, I said, I should write a book about this, call it a compendium and put everything together and break it down as we go. And people can say, oh, wow. Instead of, you know, letting people just leave it up to their own mind to try to figure out what's going on because they couldn't understand it. Now I'm going to stop you. I'm going to tell you, okay, this is the type of technology that we just talked about. And this is how we can relate to our modern times. This is what we have right now in today's age that relates to this exact same type of technology that's done, you know, thousands oh, of years wow, ago. That's wild. Yeah, exactly. So I stopped them and I go into real scientific information and break it down. Then when I get to esoteric information, I break down, I get esoteric. When I get to metaphysics, when I get to alchemical. So I keep stopping you and teaching you along the way so that as you're reading this, you're understanding it. So it's not just a bunch of verses you're reading and going, okay, now what did I just read? I don't know, I don't know what this is. You're really getting a better understanding and it's something that can affect your life. Well, is it a matter of sort of a, some of the translations I've seen are, you know, it, it's a couple of pages. It's not really that, that, that long tablet itself. Mm -hmm. But is it something that there's more encoded into it as well? Well, there's so, actually two what, tablets. Like, yeah. yeah, you have the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, which is a single tablet, which was deciphered by... Sir Isaac Newton, which is on display at the Cambridge Library in England. Right, right. And then you have the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which is an original writing by his, which is actually uh, a total, complete total of 15 tablets because a couple of them were broken down. But, but those are most likely in the Vatican archives, the original version. Yeah, sure. But uh, many other people have uh, deciphered them and even were even inspired to write books based off yeah, yeah. the tablets. So there's two. The Emerald Tablet of Hermes is, um, is not as old as the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. And there's even another book called the Book of Thoth, which is actually hidden underneath um, Thebes right now, and people are still looking for it right now, currently. No kidding. So, what is the main takeaway mm -hmm. from the Billy Carson translation? The main takeaway is that there was an extremely advanced Atlantean culture. We call them the Anunnaki. They were this Atlantean civilization that came from multiple uh, planets, not just one planet, Nibiru, multiple planets. They arrived here and there was already an advanced civilization on this planet because they talk about the great flood in the beginning and that the waters had recited and they were going to bring mankind back to a high level of civilization, which means 
implying that they were, we were there at one time before. And what was the period of time? This is about 36,000 years ago. Around the same amount of time that a lot of researchers are starting to realize the Sphinx is appro approximately that age. And Thoth claims to have built the Great Pyramid in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. So that would take you to right around 36,000 years ago. If you go back two processional periods on the Sphinx alignment with Leo, now it all lines up. Okay. Uh, and um, so, you know, they, they came, they, they decided to help mankind come back. They uh, taught more advanced sciences, sciences and technology, as well as esoteric and alchemical information, which is from the land of Chem. That's where Chem comes from. Before it was called Egypt, but it was called the land of Chem for chem chem chemistry and alchemy. Uh, and then um, he begins to teach mankind that we are living in a cycl cyclical society, cy cyclical civilization of rise and fall. But how do we get from the fallen state back to the risen state? He talks about elevation of consciousness and what it takes to get there. A step-by-step -step process on achieving that ascension, which is the same reason why we're all here, portal to ascension. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, along the way, it just talks, you know, you realize the technologies that are being used, like using, turning photonic light into, into solid matter which I talk about in the book. We just discovered how to do it about a year and a half ago in a real laboratory. We just started turning light into matter. Okay. How to turn cymatic frequencies and vibrations into uh, different uh, molecules. And all, all of this is talked about in the book because Stoke talks about it. Manifesting uh, solid matter out of the ether, uh, changing your reality tunnel by uttering specific cymatic frequencies from your throat. And okay. he even gives you those frequencies right. in the book. Right. So, you know, all these things, you know, so I, I go in and talk about it, and the real takeaway from it is how do you become an ascended uh, avatar? How do you become an ascended, you know, master? And the information and knowledge and wisdom is in there step by step on how to do this, as well as if you are in a civilization seeking to become more advanced technologically, just look at what's there and start reverse engineering it and duplicating it here. Well, that's a really great point because a lot of it, the truth is hidden in plain sight, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of people live in sort of like this mesmerized uh, materialistic world matrix yeah. right. bubble, and it's programming, television shows, mm -hmm. you know, network. It's called programming for a reason. Oh yeah, programming. So people don't pierce that veil, mm -hmm. you know, as much as they are nowadays. I, yeah. I think we we notice that we're seeing sort of that shift and that transition. Mm -hmm. So that information has always been there yeah. it's just for a matter of seeing it out in the open that delving into it <laughs> researching it and translating it transcribing it yeah who has been uh the keeper of that information is there a lineage over mm -hmm. a period of time you mentioned uh an anunnaki yeah thing, right so right from what i understand about that there's the uh nk and Enlo. yeah is that correct mm -hmm. right two factions yeah. Yeah. i mean there's two basic bloodlines there's two well that's the same bloodline because they're related but there's right. two factions oh, right. that sprung off from that bloodline uh and you know some are good some are bad you have yin and you have yang i cover this in the book as oh, well and, that, and that's true it's, it's, it's anywhere. anywhere yeah so it's, it's everywhere you know yeah. and um but if you go back this to, to the sumerian kings list which is located in the osmoli museum in oxford england okay it talks about you know just a handful of kings ruling for over two hundred thousand years before the flood the anti bluebeard kings right if you trade those, uh, um, uh, trace those kings' bloodlines into post-diluvial, post-flood, you start to see uh, where they began to, uh, they relocate, relocated from Mesopotamia or from Iraq to Egypt, uh, which was the land of Kem. They gave the half-human, half-Anunnaki, or half-Atlantean, whatever you want to call it, people, kingship. Uh, so, and then from those people would be the direct communication between them and the civilization. Um, and that bloodline is still on the planet till this very day. Now, Egypt, a lot of people don't realize, was overthrown seven times. So, you know, you have some people that say, oh, Egypt was only this race, or Egypt was only this race. They're, they're both wrong. Egypt was many races over many dynastic periods. Okay, right. Because right. they had been overthrown many times by Assyrians. But I mean, but you just name it. They were, right. But by the time they got to the end, Alexander the Great took over. Right. And they were so happy to get him in because the other guy was going, he was treating them like crazy. Like he was the worst dictator ever so they were like so happy that he came in they, they named him a pharaoh but uh the, the fact is is these pharaohs these pharaonic bloodlines started um after you know they could egypt they had lost their grip on it they started uh migrating across arabia and this took a lot of time sure. so now they're mating with arabians they're migrating up into europe they're mating with europe europeans okay by the time they got to europe and everything else and they reestablished the monarchy they're mostly caucasian people by then well 
I, I wanted to touch on that. You said it earlier. Um, see if I get the phrasing right. You said there was a responsibility or a dynasty of the kings. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, 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 in my terms, was there a, re a responsibility to the to the kingships? Mm -hmm. What what was the, what was the purpose? Wasn't the purpose to like guide humanity guide to a higher hu purpose? Guide humanity, but also be the liaison between humans and these Anunnaki Atlantean oh, okay. people. All right. In other words, if the humans, they didn't want to, they didn't want to, you know, they didn't, that would be like you own a multi-million dollar corporation. You're not going to go talk to the janitor, you know. Now, some will, I would, me and you probably would, because yeah. we're not, we're nice guys. <laughs> but the majority of these Fortune 500s don't even know who the janitor is. That's right. So they would never go talk to these people, um, you know, and. Uh, so it's interesting how history repeats yeah. itself, because <laughs> that mentality, that structure of. Yeah, that hierarchy or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's. Not a lot of room at the top, right? And if you're at the top, you're kind of defending yourself from everybody else getting to the top. So exactly. You look at things through a different lens, a different perspective, for right? Sure. But that that thought, that idea of rule, uh -huh. has has pervaded this whole period of time. Yeah. But you also talk about the thirty six thousand year cycle, yeah. sort of the change. So we're at the portal to ascension conference right mm -hmm. now. Um, how does, how does that tie in? Where are we at right now? And why are, yeah. why are the tablets relevant right now? Well, they're relevant right now because um, Thoth, when he was called Hermes the Thrice Great, he said, with my decaying hand, I write this note, this last and final note. And he's one of his avatar bodies. He was getting ready to transfer his consciousness into another body. And he left this one note that basically said that this information will be stored and hidden away until a time when human beings are born under a new sun that are ready and worthy for the wisdom. And that's us. Is that you? That's all of us. That is you, brother. That is you. <laughs> you are worthy of the wisdom. Right. But you've been doing the work. Yeah. You've been doing the great work. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So this is a time and age right now. Right now, we're in like the Tetra Yuga, heading back into the, which is the Silver Age, heading back into the Golden Age. Okay. And we're like the pioneers of that, that movement to get people uh, to raise their consciousness to another level and try to see that um, humanity has a positive and, and very... Uh, incredible future ahead of us, but we've all got to get on the same page. And that's what we're, that's what the process is now. We're in the process of getting up and trying to walk and we're going to stumble and fall. But every time a baby stumbles and falls, he remembers, the body remembers how to get that balance right. So you only fall a few times before you can start walking and then you can start running. And that's the process we're in right now. That's great. How does that sort of the origination story or that line of being down and off thing, does that jive with other origination stories around around the continent are, are yeah. you do you buy into the idea that uh extraterrestrial type of entities beings have been on the planet are on the planet yeah. have been consistent through the planet mm -hmm. that had different uh originations with humanity and, yeah. and sort of tampered with things oh absolutely to me there's no doubt in my mind and the evidence is all around us uh it's etched into stone and what's etched into stone and it hadn't been changed Anybody can go to the UCLA online cuneiform uh, CDLI library and grab a virtual stone off the virtual shelf and drop it into the translator and read it for themselves. Okay. Yeah, so you don't what's, need what's that side again? Uh, UCLA CDLI online cuneiform library. If you just Google that, it pops right up. Yeah, wow. And you can read all the tablets for yourself. So now you can translate them for yourself. Is that a pretty accurate representation of kind of oh, how yeah. they write Many, many, many scholars. Not, And the thing is, you know, a lot of people were talking about like, this Zachariah Sitchin was the only person that, that knew how to... He must read, have been reading my yeah, mind. Yeah, 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 exactly. He was the only one who knew how to read the tablets, and he was the only one who translated them. That's actually a lie, and I'm actually working on a documentary about that. I've, I've heard that. Yeah. That, that, that the, there are many translations that go... Oh, hundreds of years. Yeah, he wasn't even long. born yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So. Yeah, you know, and... Um, I'm fascinated about that. So what, yeah. what, what's the research that you're going to do? Uh, or, the reason or, what? Or what's, what's the presentation that you're going to make on? Oh, the presentation I'm going to talk about is uh, it's about, look, Zachary Sitchin was uh, created these books based off of already pre-translated content. Okay. Pre-translated content. So he didn't actually translate this information. He took any, and, and then he leaves in the beginning of his books and on every paragraph almost, he tells you the exact source for what he just wrote about. So it's not even a mystery to anybody. Yeah. So he never translated any of these tablets. He went off of pre-translated oh, okay, right. information from uh, hundreds of years ago, and uh, he was able to put the pieces of the puzzle together. What he did was he said, okay, let me get some Severian tablet. Let me get some Mahabharata. Sure. Let me get some Bhagavad Gita. Let me get some Nag Hammadi scripts. And he took a little piece from everywhere, and he said, okay, this is what I see here. 
was that was that a psyop of its time? Yes, it was. Yeah, I a mean, big basically psyop. it seems like yeah. someone was handling yeah. that result, right? It was a huge psyop, and the thing about and, it and is... It um, represents what... Who, who does it best represent? Well, I think it best represents the disinformation people, probably in the uh, the elites, maybe these direct Anunnaki descendants that don't want people to really realize... Yeah. That human beings, uh, not that they created us, but they genetically modified us to be saved. In other words, I think they deactivated our DNA, made our pineal gland smaller, and put a worship gene in, which is now scientifically proven that we have a worship gene inside of us, to be their slaves and do the labor for them and do as we're told and work in this system, in this matrix system that they set up for us, and don't ask any questions. And if we break out of that by learning about the true ancient past, then all of a sudden a multi-trillion dollar religious system collapses. Uh, the, the taxation system collapses. Bank system, Bank, all control. this stuff yeah. collapses. Control, yeah. It dissolves almost instantly. And that's why they want to keep us the way we are. There's a lot of um, viewers that come to us because we do regular interviews with um, intelligence type of insiders. Yeah. Um, the patriots, the um, awakening type of community. So some of the esoteric stuff, what's great about Billy is it's researched and this is historic stuff. Yeah. And you have to investigate. You have to, at this period of time, people are seeking out different yeah. truths because there are so many stories out there. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be a bunch of different origination type of stories. But even in that, there's going to be sort of the basic theme line that goes through all of that. The basic theme line is there's a method of control. Yeah. And kudos to them because you, know, you got to give props where props are due. Yeah. It's a system that's worked for eons. Eons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. It's great to have you be eloquent, eloquent that that point that it's um, something that kind of has existed mm -hmm. and it's a method of control. Yeah. If, if you figured out how to do that, what we're charged with right now is waking up and trying to break out of this kind of control system. Right. So that's why it's kind of important. It's, are things culminating right now? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, things are culminating. We're getting to the point now where more and more conscious people, more and more people are becoming conscious, I should say. I, I mean, I can now, I'm sitting in a restaurant, I can hear people talking about aliens, UFOs, the Pentagon doing this, and conspiracies. <laughs> Before, you would never hear yeah, open conversations yeah, sure. like that. Never in a million years, you know. Um, and nowadays, I used to hide the fact that I saw a UFO. Nowadays, oh. if somebody asks me, I'll just come out right and tell them. They say, how do you get into all this amazing work? Oh, I saw a UFO when I was a kid. Now it's like, oh, really? It's not no more like, oh, this guy's got, you know, tinfoil hat, and so forth and so on. So it's really, uh, the times are changing. I mean, I saw everything go from me talking to my friends about this stuff in the back bushes where nobody can hear us or see us, to, to exchanging VHS tapes, to cassettes, to DVDs, and now to websites and social media. So it's really expanding and, and more people are becoming a lot more open to this information and knowledge. Well, go back again, sort of with that thought. Um, there was a time in history, right? Many times in history where humanity didn't have the bifurcated brain or bicameral mm -hmm. type of brain, right? Yeah was really more unified and mm -hmm. part of that brilliant DNA tampering, the story goes, was yeah. that the ability to, to have the unified mm -hmm. hemispheres mm -hmm. was just like sort of the purpose of the Tower of Babel, is, yep. right? To just kind of confuse things. And if you can divide, division is an incredible method of control. Oh, yeah. There were what you call, I think, smarter humans back in history. Is that what you said? We we're more uh, in contact with I believe nature? That we, oh, I believe that, you know, the genetically modified people that we are now, this homo sapien sapien, in my personal opinion, now we have the same capabilities to even excel, exceed more greatness than what we were sure. before, but I believe that our cousins who were a previous hominid, the exact terminology for them, nobody really truly knows. They can guess, but, but I think that they were much more in tune with nature. I think that they had access to their magnetite crystals in their brains to navigate the planet and have higher intuition levels as to what's going on around them. They probably had to, uh, uh, ability to be telepathic, uh, communicate telepathically. And uh, I think that um, they were had more DNA connected and had, had a lot more sensory perception than we do now. So I think that they were more intelligent spiritually and we've been disconnected from spirituality and put on this, this, uh, this technolog technology path where we utilize technology, but the majority of us don't even know how to create it. Members of the Awakened community, prepare for change supporters and humanitarians alike. We desperately need your help and generosity more than ever. As regular listeners know, 
We proudly founded and finance an orphanage in Malawi, Africa that relies on our community's efforts in their daily struggles. Please help us help them by giving a charitable donation today. Your donations will provide direct assistance to improve the lives of more than 530 orphans, infirm, and widows at our orphanage in Malawi. This assistance will change their lives for the better and help sustain them. Through love, care, and education, we strive to aid our orphans out of poverty and into abundance and freedom. We can only achieve these goals with your help. Prepare for Change supports over 530 needy at the orphanage, and their daily needs are dependent on us as an organization. We provide them with financial support on a weekly basis. The vision we have for our adopted orphanage is that we can raise enough funds to eventually cover all aspects of the children's welfare. This assistance includes healthcare, formal and informal education, food and security, suitable accommodations, and safe transportation. Please hear our calls and the children's calls for help at this crucial moment. It is only with your help that we can reach our goals. We are a 501c3 charity, so your donations are a tax write-off. To donate, please visit our website, prepareforchange.net, where you can do so in a variety of ways. You can find the donate button there or donate via PayPal directly to donations at prepareforchange.net. Your donations truly make a difference. Thank you. So we're going to pick this back up. We were talking about uh, bloodlines and we we're talking about the ascension sort of uh, humanity at this mm -hmm. point. Are you seeing ascension of humanity and, and how does that sort of play itself out? I'm yeah. talking about bifurcated being here. All right. Kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that human beings are reaching another level uh, that collectively we're all getting more conscious. In other words, we're seeing when people say the term, you know, we're going into 5D and stuff like that, and people don't really know what that means. Some people tend to think it's the physical avatar body that's going to transcend into another dimension. I don't think we're close to doing that. I think that can happen, but I think that I don't think I don't believe that we're close to that. I think that what, right, right now what we're going to see is consciousness dimensions. In other words, consciously being able to see things from a 5D standpoint, where you're understanding that the past, present, and the future happen all at once. Okay, right. And you can see through things a lot more easier, see through systems, see through scams, see through uh, matrices, and see where you know you can benefit mankind in different ways, and how you can help and, and, and enlighten, you know, give your spark to somebody else. And I think that's really where it's going in terms of this enlightenment process that we're in, trying to get ourselves back to the golden age where we learn how to use technology in the right way, where we understand that uh, the physics aspect of it really does merge with the spiritual aspect and both the two go together, not separate. Separation has always been the conquer and divide technique is even used in science and spirituality to keep us from finding our true divinity. I think well, once we merge those two things together, we're gonna get to a whole nother level and uh, traveling the stars, traveling into multiple dimensions, uh, having out of body experiences and all this stuff will become pretty standard. Even tele uh, you know, telepathy, uh, communication, communicating without speaking, all these things are within the range of human capabilities. I think in a, a previous interview I saw there, you talked about downloads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have, have you had your download? Can you explain sort of that? And do you think you yourself receive like a real crystal clear type of mission? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I did have a download um, situation, and this was back around 2010 where I was working on this huge project. And I keep bringing that project up because I think that has something to do with the timing of this. I was researching the procession of the equinoxes, and I discovered that, in my opinion, the procession was speeding up, which means that the movement of the stars across the sky and the Earth's wobble. And I'm thinking, what can make this speed up? Is the Earth wobbling faster? Are we moving faster? What, you know, and I couldn't find the data, but I started finding out that there was information that the government put out a long time ago that they believed that there was another star in our solar system that they called Nemesis. And I was like, wow, this matches up with some ancient, you know, knowledge. And um, so I started looking into that and I realized that at specific times in the ancient past, there was always this calamity that was happening on Earth. And it kind of, to me, was in alignment with these procession of the equinoxes. So I started thinking there could be a catastrophe headed our way within the next 250 to 300 years. So I built this project called Fort Terranova, which is an underground base that can save the lives of 360 people. 
uh, totally off the grid for one year underground and about the size of three Walmarts, $20 million project. Who are you working uh, with on that? Walton McCarthy, uh, and uh, we partnered up on that. I told him about my concept and my idea, and he hopped on a plane the next day and flew here, uh, flew to my house uh, with the CFO. And then um, we started working on it, and that actually got um, uh, featured on the History Channel. How, how did that tie into any of the UNDs, <laughs> those that are out there, that yeah. are government, sort of? I guess that whole sort of uh, cabal, I guess, theme line. Well, it's the that, same technology. Yeah, we understand something's going to yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. Don't know exactly when the solar flash or solar flare yeah. or perception of the equinox or some sort of calamity. Yeah. And then you get into the idea of the timelines mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff too. So yeah. You're you're pursuing this as a uh, business type of adventure? Or is it it was a humanity saving my yeah, family exactly. adventure. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I was going to build my own just for my immediate family. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a former ex military um, and he had lived in an underground base in the military. Uh, and he told me that what you're saying sounds like a great concept, but the type of structure you're looking to build won't work because it's going to break in the corners. It's going to let in radon gases. It's going to, uh, if there's radiation, they can get in. It's going to, uh, you know, you're not, you're not even talking about what about the water sources and everything else. You got to be over a, um, a fresh water, deep uh, underground river and all this other stuff. And I was like, wow. He says, I'm going to introduce, yeah. He says, I'm going to give you the guy who built these for the military. And he's the one who plugged me in with the guy who built them for Oliver North. Yeah, the Oliver North signed off for this contract. He's DOD uh, uh, certified. That was around 2011. Okay. Uh, so we built that structure. So we, we did this underground base. So I thought maybe that has something to do with this experience today. One day I came home from working on this big project, and I was in my house, and um, I was just getting some sports updates, and the whole room turned lavender purplish color. Okay. And I thought my boys were playing a trick on me, so I looked over my left shoulder. Nobody was there. When I turned back around, there were two gray aliens right in my face Get up. Wow. the kind you see on the tv shows and you just the descriptions the short ones or taller ones? short because yeah. i was sitting in a chair but probably around this height maybe a little bit lower than this because it was a, like a comfort chair and they were right at eye, eye, eye height so they must have been four and a half feet or four feet tall. Was it a neutral sort of experience benevolent benevolent um, you know, they didn't speak to me in words, but whatever happened, my brain started shaking in my skull. Like, I literally felt like my brain was shaking. I was screaming. Nothing was coming out. People were in the house, but nobody heard or saw a thing. They didn't um, say, hey, really, we saw you when you were a little kid? No, they didn't say anything like that. But what happened is quickly as the shaking and the, and the pain started, it stopped. And then they just kind of turned and they kind of dangled. I don't even call it what they dangled away. Uh, they don't walk like a gate, like a human gate. They have a different kind of, I don't know, if I don't know if our gravities, I don't know what it was. It was bizarre. But they, they went through the wall. And now somebody would think that would be magic, but I understand that atoms have vibrated frequencies. And if you can match the atomic frequency of something, you can pass yourself right through it without having any impact because atoms are mostly empty space. So it's technology, not nothing mysterious. Have you, um, have you seen that through mystics? Because I've seen sort of like video. No, I haven't seen anything through mystics. But what did happen after that situation occurred, two things happened. One is the word, the phrase, worldwide telescope, it was playing in my mind thousands of times, thousands of times. And uh, so I, I finally, I went to a computer, I, I went to excite.com, which is, you know, Google was competing back then, wasn't, it wasn't the big thing yet. And I got on excite.com and I typed in worldwide telescope. And the first thing popped up was a website called worldwidetelescope.org, which is still there till this very day. Back then, you had to download software and install it. And I'm going, what is this? Is this a virus? What is my, what am I doing? So I, I just did it. I opened it up, and it, and it was the, all the space probe data that we ever sent out into space, all the Mars rovers, the Curiosity rover, Spirit rover, the Mars Global Surveyor, Apollo 11 data. I mean, all this data was in there, Huygens probe data, everything in there. And you can actually then, like you log in, public access and it's almost like you're looking through the rover's eyes and you can zoom and you can pan. Get out. Are you it's kidding? incredible. Yeah. And nowadays you don't even have to download the software. Now it's uh, you can still do it, but if you want, it runs on HTML5 now. So you can just run it right from your PC because we have a lot of RAM on our computers now. Back then we didn't. And um, I saw anomalies right away. I went to Mars Panoramas and I went to Opportunity Rover and I said, what am I looking at? And what I saw didn't belong on Mars. It was structures and broken pieces of things and whatever. Okay. That got me into anomaly hunting. Yep, yep. The second thing that happened was I started getting thirsty for quantum physics. I mean, really thirsty. Like, I was obsessed to the point where 
that one situation already cost me in my marriage, but this this other thing was bugging everybody. I mean, for three, four days, binging on computers and, and books nonstop, no sleep, groggy, frustrated, angry, and just diving in, diving in, diving in. That was around the same time, 2011-ish, you know, and uh, it lasted for a while. And um, so those two things, I say, might have been a download or at least spark some type of inspiration. Okay, there you, you go. Know, uh, I started the United Family of Anomaly Hunters for hunting anomalies. And now to date, we've downloaded over a million anomalies, of do a million images, and we've ca cataloged 58,000 anomalies total. So, you know, um, I think that these downloads happen a lot. And I think that all information now based off of physics, quantum physics, is stored in space time sure. on this etheric grid that we're, this soup that we're operating in and living in. All information, when you get an idea, you never truly get an idea. What happens is your DNA resonates in a specific frequency Draw. that draws it and downloads the information that already exists in space time or from the source. And it comes into your avatar body and then you are on the right frequency to realize it. And then you think it's a thought, or it's an idea, it's whatever. You're tapping into the divine source, the source energy. It's, if all information is here already. Nothing is new. Everything is rediscovered. Yeah, I wonder about that. I, I, I agree with that that concept that that's what the saying. There's nothing new under the sun. Right. Everything new is something old. Mm -hmm. um, we're going through sort of an evolution. We're going through a life experience type of a process. Mm -hmm. So as we experience it, whatever land, whatever avatar, whatever body type, we're yeah. having that experience. It's new to us or it's new, new to that or right. it's a new perspective on it. Right. And maybe it's a matter of things all exist. There's unlimited uh, possibilities. Unlimited potential. Yeah. That's but right. unlimited potential too. Yeah. So is, how would it be that you were investing that, creating that stuff? And do you do that sort of unencumbered? Do you, do you get hassled by? Other, other uh, government type of resources. You know, or, uh, or I, able to roam I get that that question asked a lot, and I'll tell you the biggest threat to people that are on the path that I'm on and into these types of alternative ways of thinking and technologies and so forth. The biggest threat is inside the community. I've only received death threats from people inside the conscious community, the quote unquote people, the you know the flat Earth people. Yeah the death threats from them because I believe that space exists and I believe that satellites exist and I won't promote their theory. Um, people that want to see uh, spirituality one way versus understanding in my concept where I think it goes hand in hand with sciences. So a lot of the negativity, the threats, uh, propaganda, false information. I've been everything from a convicted felon to a uh, uh, transvestite. I've been a CIA agent. I've been an FBI agent. <laughs> sure. I guess I'm getting famous. But all this is inside. No outside sources have approached me, attacked me, thrown me in the back of a van, put hat, put put a blinders on my eye, you know, put a bag over my head. None of that's happened. It's only been some of these, um, you know, unfortunately, some people inside the community that are pretending to be woke, but they're not really woke. They're just playing a game. Or on some other type of mission, or yeah. who knows what, agitated. Or, but yeah. there's a lot of things like you said. You have a particular belief system, right. and years of your life has gone down that path, that belief system, that if you're not receptive to new information, yeah, then exactly. uh, yeah, it definitely takes a toll yeah. on you. You'll never see me you. on Vine, Forbidden mm -hmm. Knowledge. You'll never go to anybody's post and see a Forbidden Knowledge comment that's, in, that's negative. Why is that? But if you go to some, con, you know, some of the stuff that I find more out of the way stuff that I'll post, or spirituality, or, or technology, or whatever it is, UFOs, You'll go down and you'll see people that post the most outrageous comments sometimes. And it's because they don't have, they have a lack of self-control. They're so, uh, they want to believe their way. They want my, they want their opinion to come out of my mouth. That's sure. what it, a, lot, a lot of the times what it is. You know, so I mean, it's part of the growing process. Does it make me angry? I don't even get angry anymore. I just, do I get, do I get frustrated sometimes? I will, I gotta admit that. But for the most part, I just see it as growing pains. Because overall, if something that I put out gets 200,000 views and 20 people say something crazy, it's still good numbers. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, I was going to say, you may not be uh, may not be an alien, but you're a superhuman type of a person <laughs> in many respects. You're doing like living the lives of yeah. multiple uh, people, it seems like. I do you're a lot. so, so, so much and you have a ton of energy. Yeah. And uh, the spirit that you bring to the community, the spirit that you bring to all the work that you do, what other type of work is it? 
uh, that we haven't touched upon that right? you're doing that you'd like to well, mention. I started a tech company in 2014 called First Class Space Agency. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a, we don't launch rockets, but we are doing... That's not a small thing. Yeah, I know. That, right? that, that should have been in my, in my notes. Sorry. About that. That's okay. <laughs> we do research and development on alternative propulsion systems and zero-point energy devices. Okay. We're, we're also, right now, I just got... I'm so excited to even get back uh, home because uh, my first prototype has just come in. Get out. For cool. a battery that I developed, uh, which is going to be sold to Nigeria. And it's a battery that will uh, handle all the outages through their brownout process. They have a lot of brownouts in Nigeria. So when that happens, this can kick in and keep a house or a small business powered for up to a week. That was another thing I wanted to uh, laud you with. You do a lot of humanitarian type of work too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one thing to be woke. It's one thing to be waking other people. But there are so many disadvantaged people throughout the world yeah. that you're affecting people. And you're a big personality and a smart enough guy that reaches people and has a message because yeah. uh, saving ourselves, saving humanity begins every step of yeah, step along the way. I tell, tell people, we are our own saviors. Stop waiting for somebody to come and save you. We're here to save ourselves, literally. We're here to be a service to others. And if everybody takes that mindset, there'll always be help coming for you because the help is coming from others that are being of service and you're being of service. And it's just this domino effect of everybody helping everybody. And, you know, we're supposed to have that embedded in this. I think that we really truly do, but we've been disconnected from it. And uh, helping other people is the key. Why did I start, start our space agency? So that I can help people on Earth. Not so that I can help people in space. I mean, that's going to be, that's the, it's the Robin Hood mindset. People still don't understand how my mind works. I'm a very uh, innovative thinker. I knew that tech and space, private space, was the next big multi-trillion dollar industry with lots and lots of revenue available for research and development and inventions. Tap into this, and now I can now give a person in India with a tin roof electricity so they could pump fresh water and have light bulbs on. Yeah. Exactly. You see, you see my, the way my mind works is not working how these people's mind. Oh, you're trying to be with NASA. You guys have no idea what I'm trying to do. Like, you can't even come close to thinking of what <laughs> well, I'm hey, trying to I, do. I'm, I'm glad to clarify <laughs> that because maybe one thing that you may or may not be familiar with, let's put there for change. Some yeah. people are really cognizant of this, but we are actually a humanitarian organization. Mm. So we have the opportunity to, to meet a lot of people such as yourself, okay. a lot of entrepreneurs that are out there, humanitarian entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that are out there that yeah. have great ideas and at some point are going to need to be networked. And yeah. we're looking at projects and event projects. And, and we ourselves as an organization have sort of embedded. Mm. I, on a personal note, would much rather be... Um, an entrepreneur and be worried. I, I think about the future as well. Yeah. That's why I thought it was such a great opportunity to be with you. Mm -hmm. We, I'm, I'm, I'm a humanitarian at heart as yeah. a little kid. We, I, I'm a lot of people out there in you know, this field, in mm -hmm. this awakening type of community, look around the world and say, we got to leave this a better place. Absolutely. We, we That's found the key. it right, exactly. <laughs> so put your heart, you know, put, 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 Put your money where your mouth is and put your heart in the work that you do and the passion that you do as well and help other people. Mm -hmm. We're all one. When you're helping somebody else, you're helping yourself, right? right. Yeah. That's the key. Mm -hmm. And if everybody thought that way, this would be a much better place, you know? So instead of trying for people trying to figure out how I'm thinking, they have to look at the results. The results is I've helped people to the tune of well over $12 billion in the last 14 years. And uh, it's all public record. The results speak for themselves. I'm a different type of thinker. Some people see the, gla you know, the glass is half full or half empty. I don't even see that. The glass is always full. Why? Because atmospheric gases are on top of the water or the liquid. So the cup is always running over, in my opinion. There you go. I think totally differently than did an average person. My brain doesn't work you know, the average way. Maybe it's because of my synesthesia that I was born with. You know, my audio and visual cortex are merged. Uh, so I see things and think a lot differently. Every sound that's going off in this room is generating a color inside of my eyes and oh, a number. Okay. Yeah, sure. You know, so colors and numbers, you know, rule my life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, maybe maybe yeah. you are actually an alien. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we're all aliens, you know, but well, I think I think that we all take on a frack. Well, I mean, meaning that humans don't, we don't really live in resonant frequency with the planet like other animals. So that's why I really do believe that we were originally before the Anunnaki that we were seated here. I just think that, you know, we're totally different the way that we operate. But um, I really do believe that uh, when you learn some ancient knowledge, like the compendium of the Emerald Tablets and so forth, you take on a fractal of that ancient aliens information into your body and to your brain. And some of that information from his 
consciousness now has merged into your consciousness. And by that method, I think that we all have an opportunity to take in information and become and have an alien mindset. It's just that we recognize it, that we recognize the alternative ways that we can think now, and the different things that we can do and the different capabilities that we have. I think we're all superheroes and we're all super beings, but a lot of us are afraid to tap into that. I think, I think that actually was, when I took that pause, kind of the line of questioning that I was thinking of. You see yourself as a person that's tapped into source, or yeah. do you see kind of your abilities, that, that kind of condition that you mm -hmm. described? I, I tapped in because in, initially I was holding back and hiding a lot of my talents or things that I thought I had a talent to do to, so I can fit in. Because the way that my mind worked as a young child, I saw things a lot differently, but I realized early if I brought it up, I would be ostracized from the groups and I was like this outsider. So I would then pretend like I was just quote unquote average. Um, and then when I got older, I realized I need to unleash these talents, you know, music, you know, writing, philosophy, uh, you know, whatever, cr you know, creativity, programming, whatever I wanted, I felt like I could do it. Five is, programming. Is, is there a better word for a renaissance man? Because that was a long time ago, right? You're like a modern renaissance kind of guy. Yeah, somebody just told me that as a matter of fact. Yeah. But I think that a lot of us really have that in us, but we have to break free yeah. of the chains. And we have to be able to want to let that energy, that cosmic energy come into us and not be afraid of what people think or how you feel. And I even, or maybe even making a mistake. I mean, I could have put out songs that people would have said, oh, we hate this music, it sucks, don't put any more music out. But I said, if they say that, then they just say it, I'm gonna do it anyway. You know, so you have to be willing to not worry about what, what, what other people think about you and how they, you know, you just gotta go out there and just try things until you find out what your true passion is. And when you find it, just attack it with everything you got. Well, it's awesome to hear you say that because you're a man who's uh, doing it, mm -hmm. it's not talk. Mm -hmm. You've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I would say you're, you could pass for a young guy in the late 30s. <laughs> so you're doing something that's yeah. feeding yourself and giving yourself a, a lot of energy. Obviously, yeah. you have a reason to wake up every morning. Yeah. And more people, if they use you as sort of an inspiration or as a guide, mm -hmm. claim that personal responsibility, wake up, realize that, you know, opportunity and possibility are pretty much endless. Right. And you're much more empowered than you think you are, mm -hmm. a lot of people. Um, help other people kind of get to that place. Yeah. So bless you for all the work that you Thank do. Thank you, I appreciate Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to uh, talk about some of the other things that you do. Yeah. You know, in, in, in skimming some of the work that you do, I don't think you get all of that sort of all at one time because yeah. people want to put you in a particular type of box. Right. It's really phenomenal all the work that you're doing. You're a fully realized human uh, person. Thank you, I appreciate Billy it. Billy Carson, can't find him. Thank you. Forbiddenknowledge.com. Thank appreciate you so much. It. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed listening to our interview and found it informative. For further information, come and see prepareforchange.net. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.